autism spectrum disorders as they now refer to is really a group of conditions that are determined by behavior. They are developmental in nature, but it's the behavior that makes the diagnosis. The behavior as far as social behavior is concerned on the one hand, and repetitive or stereotypical behaviors on the other hand. Closely linked with this social behavior is of course language, and so another hallmark of this group is language delay. The diagnosis does not imply a medical condition necessarily and is based purely on what is visible as a behavior disorder. When they are confronted with a child with autism, parents are really concerned because they would like to know what the cause could be. Well, quite frankly, I think we don't actually understand this very well and that there isn't one specific cause or an easy answer to the question. That there's a genetic component to this is very clear, but it's multiple genes that are involved, not one specific gene. And so, again, a blood test for this condition is not available. Um, and we are not quite sure what the role of these genes are and if they have to then be compounded by some environmental factors to really trigger them. So the feeling at the moment is that there's a genetic predisposition with an environmental trigger. But what exactly the environmental trigger is, we're not very sure. There's some that we know. There's certainly an association with premature babies. We know that there's an association with birth asphyxia. But really, there are so many children that are born premature at the end and also have birth asphyxia that do not have autism. So it is sometimes difficult to get this very clear what is the cause and what is the effect. Certainly we now know that parents and parental behavior plays no role whatsoever in autism. We do know that certain parents are more likely to have autistic children when they have certain characteristics, but again this does not hold true every time. Many factors have been identified, but consistently not many have stood the test of time. We know that there are some genetic conditions such as fragile X syndrome that has a very high rate of autistic type behavior so that we do know that there are some syndromes that have a very strong link with autistic behavior or even for the frank diagnosis of autism. But much research Neil, still needs to be done for us to understand exactly what the causes are. What we do understand though is that whatever the genetic causes are, they have a profound link with what is happening in the brain during brain development. Normally the brain is very rich mesh of brain cells or neurons that link and form very intricate and complicated um, connections. We know that in autism these are pared down and are very simplistic and very sparse. And we know that genes very much influence this arborification or expansion of the brain's connections. And this seems to be the main link between the genes and the ultimate autistic behavior. Just to make absolutely sure there is no misunderstanding, that there is no evidence at all that any form of immunization, MMRI or otherwise, or its preservatives, or the fact that it's given in a child that's too young has any effect on predicting that a child will develop autism. What has confounded this issue in layman's terms is that very often the symptoms of autism are only really visible at the age of two, which often follows shortly after the vaccinations or immunizations were given. This time relation then often is used as evidence that the actual immunizations are causative. But there is strong data, especially from Scandinavian countries, that have looked at the prevalence of autism as well as every single immunization that is given 
and it is clear that there is no relationship between the immunizations themselves and the onset of autism nor the prevalence of it. The diagnosis of autism is often a shock to parents because really in the first six months to even two years these children could look very normal. In fact, although we say that these children do not make eye contact and are not driven by exploration of human faces, in the first six to 12 months, they may be more likely to do these things than even the normal children. So very often, autistic children could look just as normal or even more normal than the normal population in the first 12 months and therefore the shock of having a diagnosis made by two years can be quite profound. These children look fine initially, they make good eye contact and then suddenly something goes wrong, usually after the age of 12 months. They lose interest in faces and I think one of the hallmarks of autism in this age group is that the children learn words, use them for a day and then lose them immediately again. This sort of use of words and losing words is worrying. We want children to be saying single words quite effectively by one year and if they are not doing that by 18 months there should be a further investigation. Um, so in whatever the cause may be for a child not to speak or not to speak in time by 18 months is the cutoff and the child should be seen. Very often children with autism actually do start early by saying words but then seem to lose them. This is also ominous and these children need to be referred for further assessment and diagnosis uh, before they are 18 months of age. There are those children who seem to be autistic as from a young baby and we see that these children have self-stimulation behaviours, rocking behaviours, head banging behaviours, even as small babies and then seem to get progressively worse. And then there seems to be the late onset group that really only start their symptoms between 18 months and 2 years by um, losing their language, then abnormal social behaviours and then stereotypical behaviours. So there are two big clusters of signs and it's these signs that diagnose and define autistic spectrum disorders. By using the term autistic spectrum disorder, we now incorporate all autistic children, whether they are low functioning, high functioning or Asperger's, although we are still allowed to define the spectrum by a, a term such as high functioning, Asperger-like or something like that, because they do differ in some ways, but in the most basic way, they are all the same. They have language problems and social problems, and then they have stereotypical or repetitive behaviours or interests. And that's what defines autism, is those two main groups. How we diagnose them has to do with an intensive interview and also to do a preliminary investigation of their social skills, their developmental skills, uh, their language skills. If one wanted to diagnose autism scientifically, there is a quite a prolonged and complicated method of interacting with these children. It's called the ADOS, which is a diagnostic observation test, where a child is taken through several play situations and very specific marks are given for behaviours under certain conditions, looking particularly at language, repetitive behaviours and uh, social intent. And there is a score that can be given and this seems to be the most reliable cross-cultural scientific way of diagnosing autism. Finding people that can do the ADOS is not easy. There are several experts that can do this but they are not enough to be able to diagnose every child that is suspected to have autistic features, but it is something that's available to make the diagnosis more specifically. There are lots of questionnaires, tick lists, and other ways of helping people to come to the right diagnosis. Um, I often think that the diagnosis of autism is a process rather than an event, and that one mustn't make two hasty decisions in children that appear to be slightly autistic as young children but later may actually have frank ADHD with some strange social behaviours and not necessarily present as a full-blown um, child on the autistic spectrum um, disorders.
the very first most important marker generally for children with autism is language delay or atypical language or stereotypical language. Any child who is not speaking fairly fluently, by that I mean using two to three words, by 18 months needs to be referred for further investigation. And on the differential in that group, autism should always be considered. Children with autism often learn single words around about the age of 12 months, but then seem to lose them soon after and, not, and don't use words particularly with social intent. An important issue for me with children with autism is communication or the intent to communicate. There are many children who have language delay and who do not speak, but who have profound intent to communicate, either by using their eyes, by using sign language, by using pointing, by making sounds. But children with autism seem to be quite happy not to communicate at all. They might cry when they want something, but would not be very specific. They don't point, they don't have much in the line of communication intent. They may take their parents by the hands and drag them somewhere and sometimes will even use their parents like a tool and will put their, their hand on a doorknob or on the kitchen shelf or on the fridge door to, to try and communicate that they must open. But really the intent to communicate is very basic. These children do not respond to their names, they do not know their names. If they're in a different room, they do not reply when they are called, they do not come when they are called. So their social interaction, even from a very young age, is a problem. Coupled with language problems, this can be as the first signs that this child may actually be on the autistic spectrum. Even when they do speak, and some of them do speak early, they have a sing-song quality to their voices, they use a lot of echolalia, which means they, they repeat exactly what is said. And some have delayed echolalia, which means even something they heard this morning, they would repeat this afternoon as if it is a spontaneous sentence, but in fact has an echolalic quality to it. They often mix pronouns, talking about themselves as the other person or speaking of themselves by name. They often have difficulty with gender, and so their language, even when it does develop, has not got the normal quality of a child with normal developing language. Socially, they also may present with other strange things, such as having meltdowns. Many children with autism have major behavioral problems initially. The meltdowns are usually because they are in situations that they find scary, or strange, they do not like strange environments, they do not like a change of scenery, and they certainly don't like a change of routine. Any of these things may set them off and make them really difficult. They may have meltdowns, they may run away, or they may behave with a severe agitation and be quite inconsolable. Another hallmark of this group is that they do not come to be comforted. These children may injure themselves and often will just sit there and cry. They often have a high pain threshold, so may not cry at all, uh, but don't come to be comforted. Many of them will come for hugs and kisses, but they only on their own terms. They do not like to be um, coddled or they don't like to be held or kissed if it's not on their terms, certainly not by a stranger. Many children with autism will select one person with whom they will have slightly more intimate relation um, and then avoid contact or interaction with everybody else. And this sometimes causes quite a lot of stress between two parents when the child bonds with one and seems to avoid the other one. One can't help but feel hurt that your old child is not accepting of your attention. Another issue is that child doesn't make eye contact. Often one of the first things that will be noticed is while breastfeeding the child does not look at the parents. Although again, in those cases, I would make sure that the child can actually see first before we make diagnosis of autism. In fact, all children on the autistic spectrum should be tested for vision and hearing because many of the symptoms that may present like autism could be linked to these problems and they should be sorted out as well. Because of their social issues, these children do not mix with other children well. They don't play with children. They often play parallel play. They will do their own thing,
but wouldn't like other children to touch their toys or to play with other children directly. They have a strange way of playing with toys, often will not play with toys the way they were designed. They are, uh, boys are very prone to turn uh, cars around, play with the wheels, take toys apart, just play with the undercarriage of toys, or if it's a toy on a string, they would play with a string and not actually play with the toy itself, so the pull along is not pulled. They love strings, they love ropes, they like sticks, they like stones. Um, and they often like to collect them. Many of these children are very aware of music. They love music. They love water. They love playing with water and can be quite obsessed about opening taps and playing with water. So sensory integration is also an issue in many of these children and they often have some of these tactile issues or overstimulate themselves with them. Um, because they often have self-stimulating behaviors like rocking and head rolling, head banging, which can be um, quite disconcerting for the parents, especially when they're young. When they're older, they can have other stereotypical behaviors like spinning in a circle. Some of these children just walk up and down without any purpose, often talking to themselves in some sort of pseudo language. And this, I think, is a strong marker of autism, especially when they start laughing at inner jokes. We have to try and avoid that these children go into their inner world because once they stuck there it's not easy to get them out. They seem to be able to withdraw with into this world that is real to them but not very visible um, to people around them. They may uh, collect things, some of them have obsession with sticks, some of them go to bed with sticks, um, they will take it everywhere with them. Um, it is also kind of a security or a sort of pacifying them in a way. They can have strange fears. Many of them have fears for dogs. They could have a fear for something innocuous like a butterfly, but not be scared at all for a lion. So often when there are really fearful situations, they are fearless. And often when it's really innocuous, they can be quite fearful. It's as if they cannot distinguish between uh, these kind of, of symptoms. There are many symptoms that can be defined in autism, but these give some idea of the challenges that parents can have with these children. Many children are labeled as Asperger's, and perhaps there are some issues regarding Asperger's that should be clear. A child with Asperger's is not necessarily a high-functioning verbal autistic child. Children with Asperger's are generally intelligent, and they are verbal but they have very, very stereotypical and bizarre interests. These are children that are fanatical about space, about dinosaurs, about space travel, planets. I have met some that are intrigued by antiques and strange topics that would not be natural for the age group or the gender. And this defines Asperger to a large extent. Many children that are high-functioning autistic children do have bizarre be uh, interests, but they are usually within the spectrum of what could be normal for age or gender. This does not include savants. A savant is an autistic child that has a very specific outlier ability that is a superpower in a way. A child that has a sense of numbers, uh, a child that can remember telephone directories, a a child that can remember number plates uh, but have no other skills. Um, I have met children that are gifted pianists or jazz pianists who still can't speak and who certainly socially cannot be functional. The single biggest predictor of how successful an autistic child is, is his language and his ability to communicate. Even high functioning autistic children that can communicate well battle to really, in the social world and an academic world, reach their potential. And parents are their biggest champions and often have to fight and make a case for their children to develop in a world that is generally quite hostile to people with autism. Well, that's exactly how it feels for the people that have autism. So that anxiety disorders and depression is certainly not uncommon in adolescents and adults who have been diagnosed on the autism spe autistic spectrum. I think when parents receive the diagnosis from a professional that their child has autism or is on the autism spectrum, it comes as a great shock. And often one feels very helpless 
and you don't know where to turn to. Well, I will give you a few ideas of what one needs to do. But there are two critical factors in the successful development of this child. The first one is you have to surround yourself with professionals who know the condition. And that is often quite a challenge, especially if you're living outside built-up urban areas. But the people who may be able to help you is first and foremost the speech therapist. There may be a psychologist, occupational therapist, a pediatrician, a neurologist, a psychiatrist possibly, or a developmental pediatrician or a child neurologist. But you need to surround yourself with people that understand the condition because you will need advice at many levels. And this does not exclude also your educationists who play a very important role in the management and development of your child. If you're really at a loss where to start, there are national organizations like Talk SA that you can contact and they will tell you who in your area are experts or linked to them to get the right information. It is critically important to make the right diagnosis and certainly then to be pointed in the right direction. But one thing that you mustn't feel is a case of hopelessness because there is a lot to do. The second very important point is the sooner we start, the better the outcome. There is no doubt in the research that the sooner we start helping these children, the better they can perform as adults. We cannot make any guarantees that they will be completely and utterly self-sufficient, but we need to treat them early to get the best end result. So it doesn't help to delay intervention just because the diagnosis is not certain. Even if the diagnosis is not certain, start the interventions, the sooner the better with the right kind of people to give you the right kind of advice and help. I think that something that's really useful is to video your child every few months, perhaps every three months, because that gives you a clear idea of how symptoms are developing and you've got a record to show people, but also sometimes the improvements are in such small steps that one doesn't realize what is actually improving until you watch those videos three months to six months apart and really see what strides have been achieved um, in that time. Unfortunately, for many children, there are not that many experts to help them. And there is the strange balance in medicine that the more interventions we have from professionals, the less medication we require in autism, but the less intervention there is, the more medication we are inclined to use, because that might sometimes be the only thing that we have to offer a parent within the realm of possibilities. Medication does have a role to play in autism in two ways, uh, perhaps in three. The first thing is there are medications that decrease the bizarre behaviors of autism. Certainly the meltdowns, the aggressive behaviors, the tantrums, the emotionality, but also bizarre behaviors such as self-stimulating behaviors, self-mutilating behaviors, and so on. So there is a role for medication and if it's necessary these should be prescribed. Many children with autism also present with ADHD. ADHD is not inherent in autism but it is felt that both ADHD and ASD um, share some of the genes and are also affected by the same environmental factors. Autism probably earlier than ADHD. So if the child also presents with ADHD, it is imperative that one also treats that separately because everything that we can control and that helps the child to focus and to learn um, would be useful. Children with autism have a general tendency not to want to be taught and not to be helped. And whatever we can do to try and get to be them in a position that we can teach them is critically important. The third medical intervention that's really important is anxiety. Verbal autistic um, adults have expressed their fear of living in a world of so-called neuronormative people when you have autism. According to them, the only bad thing about the world is that everybody doesn't have autism. 
They see the world differently. They have a very much a black and white approach to things. And living in a grey society where people don't often say exactly what they mean or do exactly what they said is very disconcerting for people with autism and they develop quite a lot of anxiety and eventually also depression. These should be diagnosed early and should also be medically as well as psychologically intervened because that is important uh, for your child. If there are any doubts that the child maybe have an underlying syndrome, it would be important to go to a genetic counsellor and do genetic testing because certain genetic conditions have very specific array of difficulties and it would be easier to address them once one understands what the challenges for this child may be. But really the most important thing is to keep these children stimulated, to love them and understand their needs and not have a mindset that what we've got to do is make them normal. What we have to do is make them grow to be the best people they can with the skills that they have.